Here's, a, here's the question for you. What, who were the first freelancers the, in recorded history? Who were the first freelancers in recorded history? And if you have a child that you're talking to right now, ask the child, yeah, let's see him, come on. Yeah, who was the first freelancers? Do you know who freelancers were? Do you know them? People who work for themselves. Okay. The tooth fairy. You just got a tooth out. Tooth fairy is definitely hello. Well, yes, I can see why you'd say the tooth fairy. Right there. And you are absolutely right. The tooth fairy is a freelancer. Totally, totally, totally. But other than the tooth fairy, which may be older than the one I'm thinking of, <laughs> he's a cutie. What do you think is the first freelancer? Who do you guys think? It's actually really fun. The first freelancers were Greek missionaries working for Cyrus, the king of Persia, 600 oh. BC. <laughs> Next, after that, we know that freelancers were a really important part of the Roman economy, that the construction workers and the architects and the construction engineers were mostly freelancers. We also know that starting at around the year 1000, and Liesl, you have an English accent, so obviously that, that, that connects to this last piece, which is that apparently Ivanhoe was the first book to use the term freelancer, referring to way back when, during the, the time of John and, and, and Richard and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we are part of a very important and long history. And it just so happens that we were given a name again after the, the Ivanhoe book of freelancers. Freelancers being people who are willing to work as soldiers initially uh, for pay. We don't all have lances anymore. Some of us have phones, some of us have pens, some of us just talk a lot. But uh, hopefully um, we're all doing the same thing and that is Freelancers are people that are choosing to ply their trade on an independent basis. Now, we know that we live in a world where most people find it easier to be employees, but we are seeing a larger and larger population of people around the world who are excited about the freelancer option. They're looking for the autonomy, they're mm -hmm. looking for the choice, they're looking for the independence, there are, in many ways, small business owners that happen to be solopreneurs in most cases, rather than hiring a staff. So we were very excited about the, 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 the challenges of the freelance work community these days. And so we wanted to do a survey, but we were not interested in doing another survey of US freelancers. We wanted to bring the world of freelancers together. And to that end, and Alina, you were part of it. Guillaume, you were another part of it. And the others of you may be part of it through your association or personally. We were able to pull together, I think 77 or 78 freelance platforms, agencies, and communities together. I want to, I want to be clear about that. So Alina, you run a community, if I may put it in those terms. You are not necessarily a two-sided marketplace, but in fact, what you're doing is providing service to the freelance community. We know that, that, that there are also agencies, agencies, think of agencies as, as smaller uh, platforms, if I may, uh, and some of those agencies have 70, 80, 100, or 200 freelancers, but certainly not the large population of freelancers that other platforms have. Who knows the largest platform in the world? Freelancer. Freelancer. Uh, freelancer. Yeah. Anybody, anybody know how many people on their platform? 50 million. 53. <laughs> <laughs> so what we know is that, that freelancer.com is just south in the rankings than Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the largest country. After, after, but imagine that they would be, I think, number 31 or 35 in the countries around the world if you were counting. These 77 free, freelance platforms were wonderful to join us. We asked them to participate in a 
in a, in a survey of about um, 30, 40 questions, maybe a little bit more than that, and really did a wonderful job of contributing. Altogether, 1,900 people participated. Of those 1,900 people, about 20% were U.S., and the remainder were ex-U.S., around the world. So, for example, about 40% were European. I think we had about 11% Africa. We had about 16% Latam. We had about 8% Asia, which is small relative to Asia, but not small relative to the freelance population in Asia. And in fact, we even had some wonderful folks from, excuse me, um, from other small countries that we haven't mentioned here, but we do have a very nice global participation rate that gives us a different perspective than you'd get if you were just reading the Upwork surveys or just listening to the MBO partner surveys. Of the, of the folks that we interviewed, we found a real mix. And we're gonna, we're gonna start to tap into some of those in the findings. But before I go through these findings, any questions at all from anybody before I jump in? Not yet. <laughs> okay, thank you, Gabrielle. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Let me start. Let me start with the first one. And that is freelancing is a work and career innovation that's succeeding worldwide, though with different rates of adoption. Message there is that freelancing, keep in mind, freelancing isn't a career. Freelancing is how you apply your career as, as an individual with expertise in a particular area. So we're defining freelancer as somebody with qualifications, somebody with experience, somebody with education in a very specific profession. It's not the same as the gigsters that we talk about who are trying to cobble together a living. Now, they may do some things that I don't know how to do. If anybody has ever seen somebody from TaskRabbit or another platform walk with 12 dogs, and all of those dogs are walking nicely, Bodizar, you have a big smile on your face as I say it, and I think that's magic. I couldn't keep my own dog in line, let alone 12. But it's not the same as being a professional, and that's the distinction. Freelancers are professionals who are choosing to ply their trade as solopreneurs. And what we know is that solopreneurs don't always remain solopreneurs. <laughs> Okay, that, again. that was a crash course in Italia. <laughs> <laughs> did, did somebody want to say that in English? Because I just don't speak Italian, but I, I wish I did. Okay, moving on. <laughs> what we know is, is that about 19 or 20% of freelancers are interested in building a larger business. Alina, you're an example of that. We're eventually... The solopreneur becomes an entrepreneur, and there are more people brought in. But, uh, but about 45% of freelancers want to stay freelancers. They, they want to be either part-time or full-time. And in our research, we had a very interesting mix and a surprising one. Anybody know the percentage of freelancers that are side giggers working part-time? Any guesses? 50%? Actually, it's more. It's about 75%. Say it again. 70%. I said 70%. There you go. So, Mina, you're pretty close. 75% is what we guessed. Now, what does that mean in, in practical terms? If you look in the States, and it's hard to get numbers. If you look in the States, what you'd find is about 15 million, 12 to 15 million people are full-time freelancers. And 45 million people are part-time freelancers. That is to say, they have a full-time job, but they're choosing to work on the side as a freelancer for part of their spare time. There's an important caveat when you think about that, folks, and that is that as we think about the growth of freelancing, one of the things that we believe is that it's really important for freelancers to become part of a flexible, blended, larger workforce offered to enterprises, offered to large corporates. But it's very tough when three quarters of the freelancers are side giggers because there are lots of impediments to them working on large enterprise projects. 
So one of the challenges that we have is to bring up the number and the percentage of full-time freelancers. When I say it's succeeding worldwide, what we know is that freelancers are busier from our research. They're busier. They're more engaged. They're more optimistic. Over 60% of the freelancers in our survey say that they have sufficient work. Most of them say they have satisfying relationships with clients and 63% believe that they will meet their financial goals. That's pretty good in the middle of a pandemic for people in general to feel that way. Not everybody feels that way. What we find is about 38% of freelancers wish they had more work. About 30% of freelancers wish they were better at selling. About 35% of freelancers wish that they did a better job uh, of, of managing relationships with their network to attract new work opportunities and new opportunities to grow. But what we do see is that almost two thirds of the freelancers in our population are feeling pretty good about the freelancing. And that takes us to the second piece, which is different rates of adoption. And what we know is that it's adopting at different levels and different, different speeds, if I may say so. Asia is just coming on stream as opposed to the UK or Europe, which is very well familiar with freelancing and more and more open to it. We know that, excuse me, freelancing in Russia is still happening. We know that Northern Asia is doing better than Southern Asia in the use of freelancers. We know that Africa is growing quite large. And in fact, our population of 11% was very nice in terms of some of the stuff that I'll share in a little bit. We know that LATAM is growing, that we found, I think, 16% of our freelancers were from the Latin American countries. That's a big change from just a very few years ago. So we're seeing something that really is changing the way organizations work, not as fast as we wish, not as globally as we wish, but it's happening. And that takes us to the second point, which is the freelance revolution really is large and growing. You know, it's growing in a number of respects. One is in terms of, of the penetration of corporates, 90% of big companies say that they depend on freelancers to close gaps in talent. Now, that may be more specific in some areas than others, but we're talking about something that just two years ago, we did a similar study for TopTal, it was 76%. What a change in just a few years. Pandemic helped that, but it's not just the pandemic. It's also a recognition that a flexible blended workforce is, is, is a more strategic workforce particularly in situations where you don't have the experts around or you couldn't afford them if you, if you did have them around. So it's really large and growing. We're seeing a, a real change in the, in the composition of that group. Only 8% of that group would describe themselves as self-taught. Almost 45% say they have advanced degrees. We're not only seeing, and this brings us to the one, not one type of freelancer, there is hardly a profession that we found that doesn't have freelancers working in it. So as an example, it's a wonderful group in the UK that brings retired diplomats together as freelancers for countries trying to work out treaties. Powerful stuff. We're seeing physicians and surgeons who are side gigging on, on additional time that they have available. We're seeing airline pilots that are becoming freelancers. And in fact, Singapore are dependent on freelance airline pilots. We know that musicians are in the freelance community. We know rocket scientists are. We know that architects are in Canada as well as in Lebanon. We know that film documentarians are part of it. There is hardly a part of, of the professional ethos that's not represented by freelancers. 30%, and I want, I, I, want to, I want to focus this for just one minute, Gabrielle, on you and me, and maybe on Guillaume, but I'm not sure. 30% of freelancers are over, 50, are over 50 years of age. This is, you're, when you're going like that, you're not, you're 49. <laughs> I'm 
I understand. I'm 69, so I'm way over the limit. Yeah. <laughs> but but you know, it's it's the, the the thought that we used to have, which is that freelancers are kind of the hippies of this generation, and they're bopping all over the world, living in trees in Bali, doing coding between midnight and six o'clock in the morning. That is that is not our world any longer. That the freelance world is a very diverse and very inclusive community. It's really terrific. Fourth, freelancers are by and large optimistic and confident despite the challenges. That's a really important thing to remember. We did a survey, part of our survey was to ask uh, freelancers to describe themselves against a variety of criteria. So uh, are you good at marketing? Are you good at dealing with people? Do you like people of different kinds? Are you persuasive? Do you accept risk? What we found by and large, despite the fact of the challenges associated with the, the, the pandemic, despite the fact that many of the people we were talking to were in the marketing areas, which had been hurt, we're in the events or hospitality sector, which has been decimated for a little while. What we learned was that by and large freelancers are optimistic, they are excited, they are enthusiastic, they believe that they'll do well, and they are, they are not just hopeful, but they are ambitious for their success as a career in, in freelancing. It's absolutely wonderful. And you know, you'd think that they would describe themselves a little less, but they didn't. You'd think that older freelancers might describe themselves a little less than younger. They're not. You'd think that women might be a little different than men. They're not. We see a, a population overall with one important gap that feels pretty good about what they're doing. The one group that's having some tough difficulty, and we'll talk about this later, are any of you independent management consultants? Independent management consultants are having a little bit of a tough time, and let me explain why. I, I, I was a management consultant for a lot of years, management consultant, I taught stuff like that. So my life used to be pretty cool. You know, I, I'd roll out of bed and I'd get in a black car and they'd take me to the airport and I'd sit in a business class or first class seat and fly somewhere pretty interesting. I'd land, I'd have a meeting and people thought I was hot stuff. Then I'd go to my four or five star hotel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, folks, ain't that world anymore. Not if you're a freelancer. You're not paid as much. You're not feeling quite as elite. And, and it used to be that I believed that I got all these jobs because not my firm, it was just me. But it's hard to get work as an independent management consultant, especially the big projects. So for all of these reasons, they're having a little bit of difficulty. And what we're gonna say to you in a little bit of time is, is that the most important thing that platforms can do for them is help them understand, A, whether they really wanna be freelancers, and then onboard them in a transparent and honest way in terms of what it is like to be a freelance independent management consultant. It's not the same as being a, a, a firm-based management consultant. Number five is it's important to recognize that freelancing is a source of public good. And I am so proud of us as a population. And I know I'm sounding very, um, how would you say, enthusiastically American right now. And I am absolutely enthusiastic. And here's, here's why. Freelancing is an economic engine. And what we heard in our survey again and again and again was that freelancing is an engine that connects opportunity to talent on a global basis. No longer are we an accident of where we happen to be born, where we happen to go to school, what we happen to study, who we happen to hang out with. Freelancing and the technology that supports it enables us to put opportunity in the hands of people that might not have it otherwise, but have tremendous talent. I wrote two children's books and had the pleasure for, I, I have three and almost four uh, grandchildren. And for the first two, the third isn't old enough yet. I wrote little children's books. I don't think they're brilliant, but I was able to go to Fiverr and for a couple of hundred dollars US, was able to work with somebody to put together wonderful illustrations that made it real. A, 
I wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet that talented person without the freelancing world. And B, she wouldn't have had the opportunity to make $250 or $300 for a couple of days' work. So this was a win-win of an extraordinary niche, and we're creating those win-wins all over the world every day. In addition to that, as you think about the pandemic, freelancers played an absolutely critical role. CollabTree is a UK-based platform serving R&D scientists. They played a tremendous role in a number of the pharma companies that were building the vaccines. LifeSci Hub is a US-based platform focused on pharma quality assurance and project management. They played a critical role in making sure that the vaccines were safe and reliable. This is not just talent meets opportunity. This is also doing good in the world. We know that, excuse me, flexing it in India is able to connect people with Spain. We know that CLAP in Estonia is able to connect people with the US. We are, we are building economic freedom for a great many people as well as doing good. Next one, and I, I wanna turn for a second, but before I do, questions, comments of any kind. Okay, next, freelance platforms number six must continue to add value to freelancers. This is a very big deal. You know, there are five things that, that people want from their platform. First thing they want is work. Second thing they want is a, a knowing that there's enough of a flow of work that it's worth hanging in there. Third, they want help managing their business because the chances are pretty good that they love doing what they're doing but not running the business of what they're doing. Fourth is they want to be future-proof. They want help in staying up to date. And five, they want to feel as though they're part of a community that they're giving to and giving back. Now, most freelancers don't belong to multiple freelance platforms. They belong to one or two, at least according to our data. And, and so what does that mean? Well, it means two things. One, it means that they're really depending on their, on their freelance platform for a lot of help. And two, it means that freelance platforms in the future, and I want to say this carefully because it's a, an important point. In the future, freelance platforms will be monetized as a function of how well they help their people get and keep work because that's what creates the value of the platform. So we have an interesting situation where what we need to do is help platforms to do a better job in teaching their freelancers to be successful and to remain successful over time. We also need to do a better job as platforms of finding ways to mentor senior people to junior people, people with experience, to people with less experience, et cetera. So in a whole variety of ways, it's really important for platforms and communities, as you're doing, Alina, with this community and agencies, to understand that it's not just an economic engine for work, it also has to be a learning engine for increased competence and capability. And the platforms that do that best are the platforms that will succeed in the future. And if you don't have one that's doing that kind of stuff, push for it. And if you're not pushing for it, ask for it. If you're not asking for it, think about whether it's the right platform for you guys. So, um, John, yeah. sorry, it's Angel here. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned number three is the chances and number four is the future proof. Um, and it's about the support. So I'm doing my research on the support for freelancers. Ah. More from the coaching perspective. Yeah, that's the PhD that I'm embark uh, embarking on. And it's basically the support is mostly mentoring, networking, collaborating, being on these platforms, being in a community. Um, which is absolutely fantastic, but there's not more, there's not enough of it. What well, is and your... there's a structural problem. Yes. These so this is the structure, big... it's, it's the actual, I'm calling it a systemic support or integrative support system that's needed here that, that doesn't just mentor. Older, younger, I'm young, 
I sometimes mentor older people as well. So it goes both ways. Um, networking, I'm, I'm connecting with people that are in various industries outside of the one I am. Collaborating right. with, with people that's in the same industry, but then the competitiveness comes into play very quickly. Well, um, and that's but the then the coach, that's coaching. Yeah, so then the coaching, so all of this together, you, you have an integrative systemic role almost as a support function. And how can these platforms almost like, lev- like alleviate it? That's, that's yep, my the most important. Yeah. The most important thing, Liesl, is, is to revisit the structure. The, the problem is that we're, we've set up most of these SaaS platforms on a hub and spokes basis. So for anybody that doesn't know hub and spokes, think of your bicycle tire, right? Each of the spokes connects to the center, but it doesn't connect to one another. So long as we have a hub and spokes mentality in platforms, and I'll give you a specific example of that, we're not going to get the degree of collaboration that we need. And, and you know, at the end of the day, it really is the, 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 uh, the rising tide that's going to lift all boats. Uh, one of the things that I like very much is the idea that many platforms have done a much better job or are starting to do a much better job of helping people to experience early success. So there, there is a bunch of that stuff. And if you're doing your research on it, Liesl, write to me. And I've got a ton of stuff on that. On that. Also write to Diane Funkhausen, who's part of the Center for the Transformation of Work, whatever the Open Assembly is called. Diane is a platform specialist and she's super smart much smarter than I am. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'll oh definitely... my God, it's my pleasure. It's absolutely my pleasure. Um, any other questions at all? Next one. It's time for platformers to help freelancers by helping clients to be better. You know, 45, by the way, we're doing better around that. 45% of freelancers said, my clients know how to work with me. That's powerful. And it's a lot better than it was just a couple, three years ago when we would have gotten 20, 25% because they just didn't know how to do it. And they thought that freelancers were like employees, but not quite as good. Well, we've dismissed that nonsense from most of the world. And what we know is, is that many times when companies hire consultancies or agencies because they think they're higher quality, where do you think the agencies and consultancies have gotten their folks from? Kind of crazy, kind of crazy. 30% of EY, 30% of PWC, 30% of, De- of Deloitte, about 20% of Accenture. That's, that's freelancers that are former members of that organization or friends of that organization that are currently working on projects for them. So we're already living in a, in a uh, flexible blended workforce world. We just got to understand that. As we talk about time for free platform to help freelancers by helping clients to be better, there are six things that clients need to do well in order to, to earn the trust and activity of their freelancers. First is they need to be clear about the philosophy that they're coming in with. Is this just on demand as little as possible? Or do they really want to build more of a flexible blended workforce? Second, freelancers are unique in wanting performance management, unlike employees, because we need it. Because based on that performance management, we do better and we get jobs. If we don't know that our freelance our clients are, are upset with us, we're going to be in trouble when we try to get the next job. So we've got to do a better job of getting feedback but we also have to do a better job of giving feedback. And some organizations, some platforms do a really nice job, of, if I may put it that way, almost protecting their freelancers by making sure that, that these, these companies really know what they're doing, have set it up for success, are accepting feedback, are working with the freelancer, or checking in with the platform, et cetera. Third thing is we need to make sure that managers of freelancers know how to work with freelancers. It's not the same as working with employees. Freelancers are volunteers. It's a peer relationship, not a subordinate relationship. Fourth, 
when freelancers are whether they're whether they are remote or or on the job on site freelancers expect to be treated like a member of the team and and what we know is that for the most part organizations are doing that for the most part people that they're working with are friendly are helpful are providing them with the information and support they need one area is different than this how many of you raise your hands how many of you work for uh, nonprofits, not for profits, agencies, governments from time to time? People in general say they are much worse to deal with than corporates. And, and what, what we're saying is, and you'll see it a little bit later, that the magic is in the mix. That the people that are happiest, and maybe I'll jump to the next one and then come back to this, the people who are freelancing and are happiest are the people who are doing a mix of startup SMB work, small, medium-sized businesses, and corporates. From the corporates, you get the longer time frame. From the SMB and, and startups, you get the more innovative, interesting, sort of get it done fast, prototype the heck out of it, et cetera, work. And, and what I'd say to you is the problem with, very often, with, with not-for-profits or governments is that Freelancers don't think that they have the, the, the clarity of, of how they want to use freelancers. They expect a lot more than, than, than uh, they're willing to pay for, as an example. Uh, the second thing is, is that they don't see the, the project managers as strong and aware of how to work with freelancers. And third, they don't see the teams as strong. They often see them as competing with the freelancer rather than working together with the freelancer. And I think that that speaks to some of the ways in which unintentionally nonprofits use freelancers, which is to see them as an, an alternative to their people rather than a supplement to their people. And we just talked about when it comes to freelance work portfolios, the mag magic is in the mix. You want a mix, you want a portfolio, you want, some, you, want to, you want to try to do different things. If you're not managing your portfolio, you're, you're not doing as much as you can to provide yourself with a great experience. Number nine, it's tough out there for many. And I mentioned 38% of our freelancers are still having a tough time and that they can be helped by providing new opportunities. So for example, um, writing a newsletter is, is an opportunity that freelancers can help make available to uh, the, the platforms can help make available to their freelancers. Many of you are experts in a certain area and ought to be doing something in an expert network kind of capacity, where instead of working on a project basis, you're providing insight based on your expertise to clients who can, who, who, who can benefit from it. Some of you may be interested in interim assignments. There's much more of that in Europe than there is in the States, but we're having more of it in the States. Well, what's happening increasingly is these are three, six, nine month projects as opposed to on demand a couple of weeks. The message there is we have an obligation as platform leaders to help our freelancers to be successful. And that means taking, the, taking advantage of opportunities to help them to find more ways of earning a living. That leads to number 10. Coopetition is a word that I, I can write more easily than say, but the, the notion is how do we make sure that we're collaborating while we recognize, as Lisa said earlier, <coughs> that we're also competing. And at the end of the day, platforms need to come together to really help the, the entire freelance community <coughs> to grow. Right now, we're at about $12 billion in, in market value. If you take all of the, the freelance platforms around and all the money that's been raised, they'd say around $12 billion. I don't believe that for a second. I think it's much more. I don't think they're counting the uh, at-risk money that they've, they've put into A's, B's, and C's. But the reality is that compare that with the overall staffing industry, which has a value of about a trillion dollars. So we are 1% of the value of the, the overall staffing industry, but we represent much more than 1% of that. So we have, a, 
we have a challenge as a group of communities, as a group of platforms to help our, 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 our economy to understand the degree to which we are making a contribution. And as we do that, we will help to create more opportunity for the both the for-profit and not-for-profit freelancers that are part of that overall population. Last, um, and, and I'm gonna say number 11 really pretty quick, and that is um, the combination of tech and, and COVID has, has been an extraordinary gift as well as a tragedy. And it's possible to be both. It's obviously a tragedy. And at the same time, for many freelancers, uh, it was what accelerated their business or it's what accelerated their decision to move into freelancing. At the same time as people see greater opportunity, they also see, as Liesl mentioned, more challenge because there are more folks out there. In our population, about 10% of the folks that participated in our survey had been freelancers for less than a year. So we see a lot more people coming in. We see, as I, as I mentioned that, we had three categories. People who are, people who are freelancing full-time temporarily until they can get a job, people who are freelancing temporarily, people who are freelancing permanently full-time and people who are part-time. Of the people that we saw that in our population, uh, about 12%, I think it was 12%, said that they are freelancing until they get a full-time job. We also saw about 15% of, of folks that weren't very happy with freelancing, but we're gonna make sure that they made it work. We think those populations are the same. But the big message is only 12% in our, in our survey, and we had a very nice, robust global survey, uh, saw themselves as only doing this until something else happened. Most of the folks thought that they'd either remain side gigers or they'd move into full time. And overall, as I complete this introduction, uh, more than 60% said we're committed to a freelance life, whether it's full time or, or side gig. So overall, uh, you know, it's amazing how much has changed since I started paying attention to this in 2013. And, uh, and since some of you have been around for longer than that. And, uh, and I'm pretty excited about what we learned and I'm delighted to answer any questions that you have. John, thanks a lot. It's been interesting. You thrown actually some numbers that made me like, oh my gosh, are we really in one trillion economy? Um, but probably, yeah. But my question to you, because uh, today we're talking about the future of freelancing. Yeah. So what do you see as a future, taking the results of the study and the data that you've got? Yeah. Where are we heading with all this? You know, I, I think the best answer is, is, um, is more and different. So I'll give you a whole bunch of more indifferent. One is freelancing has influenced employees as well. I, I wrote an article some time ago that basically said, as a result of the freelance movement and the experience of, of COVID, you have an awful lot of people in employees who are what I'd call freelance light. If you were to look at the data on how long people stay in a job, the old saw that, that used to argue against freelancers, which is they're not loyal, no longer has any meaning whatsoever. France, as an example, if you take a look at how long people are in their jobs, uh, the typical French young professional is in his or her job for less than a year and a half, right? So what we know is, is that people are, are, people are asking for many of the qualities that you would get from a freelancing career, but without leaving. That's one big change. Second big change is there's absolutely no doubt that, that as we see more and more and more people working remote or hybrid, that the difference between a freelancer working remote and a full-time employee working remote is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what's happened is a result of that people just have, have had a, a, a whole bunch of experiences they didn't expect to have with freelancers. And as a result, 90% of organizations are saying, we, we think that we need more of you, not less of you. That's turning inevitably, as I mentioned with EY or PwC or the, the major service organizations, that, that they're establishing, they're not talking about it, but they're establishing um, workforces that are blended and flexible. 
And, and so you're seeing more and more organizations in these areas. The last thing I'd, I'd say, Alina, is that you're seeing more and more professions who believe that they can be freelanced. I'll give you my favorite. I, I, this will sound a little funny, but it's always fun to end on a funny note. And that is, does anybody know the, the freelance platform called urban.co? Urban.co provides, used to provide massages. Now it does yoga as well. Jack Tang is a guy that runs it. He sold four, no, 250,000 massages in 2020. In 2020! Now, you got to ask yourself, how would you feel about getting a massage when somebody's dressed in PPE and you don't see any, you actually don't see the person. It's just all, you know, opaque white. But God bless the French. Because <laughs> they, kept, they kept his business going all year. And he said he'd never had as good a, a year. I don't understand it. But if, if Jack Tang can sell a quarter of a million of, of, um, of massages and some yoga over the course of 2020, I think anything's possible in this new encounter.